Everybody, welcome. You're hanging out with Ben, and this is the Hardcore Punk Project. With five long years passed since the most recent studio album, Atonement, on February 18th, 2022, Acts of God will be released, which, show, which vigorously showcases Immolation's ability to consistently create fascinating sounds while still keeping their feet firmly rooted in the old-school New York death metal for which they are renowned. Today we have Steve Shalotti, the drummer for Immolation. Their new album, Acts of God, comes out February 18th on Nuclear Blast Records with 15 killer tracks. Thanks for joining me today, Steve. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. Appreciate the kind words. How's the day going so far? Great. Uh, matter of fact, I just finished a uh, rehearsal for a tour, so uh, did some exercises and ran through the, the set list, uh, just trying to get everything tuned in and ready to go. All right. First off, are you okay with the teen interviewing you? Sure. Okay. Why, would, why wouldn't I be? <laughs> of course. Um, I imagine you'll be touring after the release. Now, what does that look like with who and where? Uh, our tour starts here in about a week and a half-ish. Um, it's February 18th uh, in Richmond, Virginia, and we're touring with a band called Imperial Triumphant. We're from New York, uh, which is they're a band unlike anything you've ever heard, I guarantee uh, and also a band called Mortiferium. Um, they're kind of like a, a sweet, uh, groovy, dark, old school feel to them, even though they're like younger fellas. Um, but it's like very incantation, uh, demolic, autopsy type sounding stuff. So it should be a really cool, well-rounded package. I hope so. Five years since your last release. How did it feel to be back in the studio recording new material? uh it felt good um it we felt a lot more confident we had a lot of time to uh develop this album uh compared to the past efforts have been usually kind of rushed you know usually we have a deadline or whatever but because of the pandemic we ended up our last touring cycle for atonement uh right when the lockdowns happened and so it gave us uh, an extra long time to work on this album so we were able to write a lot more and uh, work on the material that we had written more extensively. Okay. Um, are studio dreadlines stressful, studio deadlines stressful for you when you're working on the songs? For sure, for sure. In the past, there's been a lot of rushed uh, uh, processes uh, when it came to writing and uh, pre-production and stuff like that. and. Uh, as the drummer, I'm the first guy that's got to go in and lay that stuff down. So the deadlines mean a lot more to me, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, there's always a lot of pressure. At least I feel a lot of pressure. And I'm always trying my utmost to prepare myself, you know what I mean, as best I can. So I can be more relaxed when I go in. All right. Uh, do your personal lives affect your songwriting process? Like, example, if you're feeling frustrated, does that affect the lyrics? Um, certainly, certainly, uh, that, that's the root of it really. Um, but, uh, what those guys are writing, the lyrics I wrote are things that, uh, have impacted them in one way or another, or, you know, inspired them. So it's a strong enough, uh, inspiration for them to actually write lyrics about it. Um, I've only written a uh, contributed to the lyrics, uh, in a very small part since I joined the band. So I can't speak purely for them, but as the process from what I've seen, that's kind of how it goes. You know what I mean? Those guys are talking about issues that have affected them or impacted them or, uh, you know, caught their attention or uh, their ire or whatever, you know what I mean? And made them feel the way they do. So they're passionate enough to want to, uh, you know, dedicate a song's lyrics to it. So. Yeah, okay. Um, what song off the album do you think will be the most difficult to play live? Um, I think Apostle is going to be the most difficult one for me to play live. Um, that's got the, the most top speed um, kick drum runs in it. Uh, and we're playing it. Uh, I think we're going to be playing it like dead last in the set. So the very last song. 
Uh, so I foresee that to be a challenge. Although when you're to the last song, you kind of have an extra adrenaline dump at that point because you know it's the last five minutes of the, the set that night and your last chance to get everything out of you. You know what I mean? So you do kind of pull reserves and stuff. But yeah, definitely. I think that one's going to be a tall order for where it is in the set. But uh, it's cool. I'm up for it. I been, like I said, I've been practicing, so it should be all good. All right. Uh, can you enlighten us from the time you joined the band, so 2003, how you guys have evolved? Uh, yeah. Um, so 2003, uh, and I'm not sure why, but to me, being familiar with and being a fan of Emulation before I joined the band, it seemed like uh, when we wrote Harnessing Ruin, Bob had uh, kind of changed a little bit the way he was writing. He had kind of streamlined things a little bit more. Uh, Unholy Cult had a lot of uh, weird um, dog legging and, and um, a lot of herky-jerky kind of uh, strange riffing. Um, and he seemed to be trying to uh, streamline that a little bit on Harnessing Ruin. Um, and also uh, the band chemistry was very new. Uh, like I said, the, the process running up to that was kind of rushed and uh, not um, not done in a traditional sense where the band was, we were together jamming those songs all the time because those guys are, were from New York City. I'm from Ohio. So, uh, and the other guitar player was from Florida at the time. So there was, a, you know, a lot of distance involved there. So we only got together a couple of times. Things changed a lot. You know, a lot of it was very last minute. Um, so then from there, though, we started to get more of a feel for the recording process, what was necessary on our parts to take care of individually before we got together in the studio. Uh, and so things started to evolve from there. I think Shadows in the Light was a little more of a smooth project. Uh, same thing with Majesty in the K. And on Majesty in the K, we uh, brought in um, Zach Warren to do the mixing and mastering, which was an important uh, turn for us. And everything since then, it's kind of been an evolution. Um, when Atonement came out, uh, it was very well received, very exciting for us. And uh, it seemed like we were honing in on what we wanted for our sound and uh, uh, the style and uh, the, um, the chemistry between the players at that point. You know what I mean? It was like we were very familiar with each other, played with each other many, many, many times. So, uh, and then also for me personally, it was like, uh, I have to trust, put a lot of trust in Bob's vision because Bob is doing, uh, you know, most of the writing and, you know, uh, orchestration of the whole thing. And so, uh, and a lot of points where I might be uncomfortable with something or not, you know, uh, completely uh, on board with, with the way he wants to do it. I have to trust in him enough to try it. You know what I mean? Let's see it. Let's see how it happens. And you know what I mean? Nine out of 10, nine out of 10 times the dude's right on about what he's telling me. So, uh, I had to get used to that too. Um, and, uh, this album, this newest album is, uh, a good example of that. There was a lot of, uh, things that I just had to trust in the Bob vision and go forward with it. You know what I mean? And it, it ended up sounds sounding great, you know? So, um, but yeah, Overall, I think it's just been a streamlining of, of the music. Like, uh, Emulation had a tendency to here and there, like, draw things out a little too long, I think. You know what I mean? Back in the day, here and there. And uh, we've got a much better feel for that. Um, a lot of our experience playing live reflects on what we end up going with in the studio because, you know, you may have this epic part that sounds really cool and, you know, it, it takes a long time to develop and unravel or whatever on cd or you know on listening to it but to play it live then you know what i mean you, sometimes it loses its effectiveness or you know it could even drone on you know we've had parts like that that are like oh it sounds cool but when you try to do it live it's just too too much uh you know so we've taken that into account when we write too you know what i mean so we just keep evolving keep evolving and uh trust in bob <laughs> the man with the vision all right how do you think technology has evolved your style of music? Technology has evolved our style of music. Hmm. Because you know it's I don't, 
I don't know if it's evolved it necessarily, but it's enabled us definitely to uh, to evolve. Um, because like I was saying earlier, you know, this has always been a long distance band since I joined, uh, just because I'm in Ohio, they're in New York. Uh, you know, we had Bill before he was from Florida. Now Alex is in Virginia. So we're still pretty spread out. Uh, and we have to do a lot of stuff digitally, uh, by email and all that stuff. So, um, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be able to write the way we write and, uh, and, and to, to do the things we do. I mean, it would just be impossible. Um, and it took us a while to embrace that, you know, but once we did and started learning how to use it, um, it was to our, definitely to our advantage and it enabled us to, to get to where we are now for sure. Uh, this last album, especially, I got to spend so much time just playing with the drums and like recording whatever ideas I had and then just email it over to those guys that night, you know what I mean? And say, hey, do you like this? Do you like what I'm doing here? And they would, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down things, you know, give me feedback that I could take into the practice spot the very next night and work on it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you're not there together working on the stuff, but you're still able to get that kind of minute to minute feedback from the rest of the band and in a long distance situation, you just can't do that. You know what I mean? You know, the other, any other way. So technology definitely helped us out there for sure. Right. Yeah. Cause a lot of people like to say that computers ruined rock music. Yeah. Which is uh, partly true. Yeah, I guess um, it depends on the music, man. It really does. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's all kinds of, of shades of gray and uh even even in the you know the tiny slice of the pie that the death metal subgenre is there's bands that are very technical sounding and computery sounding and then there's bands that are super organic uh you know no technology sounding you know very analog if you will so it's like uh you know it just depends on the band i think you know and that and the, the way the band decides to go you know we had to embrace uh you know technology um and use it to our advantage so yeah mm -hmm. so if one of the songs on this new album was the intro for a game show which song would it be and what would the game show be called um i would say uh broken prey would be the song and the name of the game show would be trial by chainsaw Ah, good. Um, uh, what is the strangest object you have fallen in love with? And it can't be your drums. Strangest item that I've fallen in love with. Um, that's a good question, man. Can't be my drums either, huh? That's no, this is coming from a fellow drummer. It can't be your drums. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Man, um, I'd have to say it's going to be like an article, article of clothing. Like, so I'd, I'd say like, I've had shoes that I've been very, very, very attached to and fond of and, and very uh, reluctant to get rid of, you know, and when that day comes, it's, it, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of an event, <laughs> uh, especially playing shoes, which I, gu I guess that doesn't count as drums, but it kind of does. And then I've also had I've had hoodies and stuff that have uh, been with me through a lot and been with me um, to a lot of places in the world and, uh, you know, through thick and thin. And uh, so you, I kind of uh, grow fond of of those sorts of items, you know what I mean, that have been trustworthy and and. Uh, I've relied on a lot, you know, like a hoodie. When you're on tour, your hoodie is everything. It's your blanket, it's your pillow, it's, you know, your napkin, it's it's everything, you know what I mean? It's, so, uh, so yeah, I guess it, it'd be down to like clothing items, like either like a good pair of playing shoes or I've had a couple of hoodies that have been through hell with me that are right. solid. Okay. Have you ever recorded the drums first and then given them to the other members to add their parts? No. No. Oh, kind of never. Yeah, no. Usually uh it's Bob giving me the basic 
a rhythm guitar riff and his idea of a drum groove on like the drum machine. So I'll get that and then I have to like build off of that or whatever, you know what I mean? Or, or use that as my framework. Um, so it's, it's it, up to this point, it's never gone the other way. I've never gone like, hey, check out this drum beat. Can you build something off of this? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, which one of these songs is your baby? Like the one you enjoy playing the most? Broken Prey, again, the game show okay. song. Okay. Yeah, I spent a long, 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 long time with that one. Okay. Have you ever intentionally backmasked anything, like subliminal messages, stuff like that? Never. Uh, how about unintentionally? Uh, no, man. The, the closest thing would be uh, just including little outtakes and stuff. Uh, and I did that with my band before, Immolation, uh, Odia Sanction, on our recordings. Um, there was a lot of turmoil and angst in the studio that was coming out and uh, the, the producer did a good job of capturing some of that stuff and uh, ended up including some choice moments on the on the full length recording or whatever but uh, that's the closest thing never never any accidental nuggets although you know what there's a spot on this new album and I heard it again today when I was practicing to it in the headphones where everything stops and I hear something in the background, almost like a shout or something like that. And then, and then the song comes in. And I may be crazy. I may be completely hallucinating. But if so, it's a very consistent hallucination because I hear it every time I play that song. So yeah. listen through and maybe you'll hear it too. Yep. If you were to backmask anything, what message would you send? Trust no one. <laughs> okay, good. If you had one minute to address all the world leaders, what would you say and why? <laughs> oh, I would say grow up because the fate of our species depends on it. Okay. Um, there's a game out there called Teardown, which is a game where you destroy things in crazy ways. Sounds great. Which one of these songs could destroy a building with sheer force alone? Ooh. Mm. Um, there's a song, Derelict of Spirit, uh, that is super pounding and sludgy. Uh, and just the guitar tone comes through really, really savage on that. And I feel like some of those hits in there and the bass is pounding too, some bum 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 like rhythm. And uh, I feel like some of those hits could definitely uh, bring down a building, man. All right. That'd be the building level there. Uh, have any of your albums been remastered? Um, that's a good question. And I can't answer it with 100% surety, but I would say no, not that I know of. Okay. There was like, there was some old album um, that they did that may have been, but it was it was a, like a, um, I I'm trying to remember because they did Stepping on Angels and I'm trying to think if that one was ever remastered. If, if any of them were, I think that was the only one. Okay. And if one of your albums were remastered hypothetically, would we actually? Would you actually put effort into remastering it, or just boost the sound to hell like everyone else does? Oh no, uh, this I'm pretty sure I've got everybody on board with me on this one. Uh, we would love to remaster "Harnessing Ruin," uh, and uh, yeah, we would do we would do everything we could to make that one sound uh, on par with the rest of the collection. Uh, that one to us sounded really good before it was mastered like everything sounded great and then when it came back and when we heard the, the final mix it was just like seemed like things had slipped or it just sounded different to us and less satisfying and it's always kind of been a thorn for us like that one was one that we wanted to sound a lot better than it ended up sounding so without a doubt we would go back and do that one we'd do it 100 all right all right uh what have you learned about life from a kid what have I learned about life from a child? Um, uh, 
never stop running. Okay. Okay. Um, is there one positive thing that you have learned about life that you would like to share? Boy, I don't have a whole lot of positive stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, positive thing in my life. <laughs> um, I think uh, that life is beautiful in a very microcosmic way. Uh, and you're never very far from that. If you can get out into nature and just stop for five minutes and don't do anything, don't smoke a cigarette, don't make any noise and just sit there and observe what's going on around you and try to see even down to a very small level, like just take a very small area and observe it for five minutes straight and see what's going on there. You'll see the beauty of nature and life. And I think like I said, it's never very far away. You know what I mean? You can go anywhere in nature and, and do that. And that always grounds me and uh, enables me to keep going, even through all the negativity. All right. So now when we finish this interview, you step mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. I step outside. Uh, and you find a lottery ticket that ends up win winning $10 million. What would you do yeah. with it? What would I do with it? Uh, I would buy a house. That's what I want to do next with my life. I want to get a house, man. That's right. what I would do. Nice. I mean, I know that leaves a lot left over. Uh, but I'm not a, a super fancy guy. I don't need like a lot of expensive stuff. You know what I mean? So I would buy me a really nice house in exactly where I, a nice spot. And, uh, you know, the rest we'll just see. <laughs> All right. Uh, what song on this on this album would you suggest we use to try to contact an alien species with? And what did you think their mm. and what do you think their reaction would be? Wow. Mm. Uh, I think that I would use the very first song, which is uh, just kind of actually an intro. Um, it's called Abandoned. And if an alien species heard it, I think they would permanently cut communication with our planet for the rest of their existence. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so depressing. <laughs> and miserable i think it would be like we don't have want anything to do with whatever's going on down there all right now uh you're at nasa in the control room and you see a red flashing button no one is looking the number above the button is 666 do you push it or do you not push it <laughs> no I, I don't push it okay fair enough everyone else i've interviewed <laughs> says they want to push it yeah yeah. yeah, that's that's my gut reaction would do not be pushing that. <laughs> okay. If you could open a if you could put anything in a time capsule that would not be opened for 30 years, what would it be and why? Hmm. Hmm. I would put, why wow, that's a good question, man. I don't know. That's tough. Mm -hmm. I would put the genetic sequence for a tiger, Oh, uh, a Siberian tiger. And I put it in there and uh, just in case, because uh, I think they're probably going to be gone the next 30 to 50 years completely so in case nobody else grabs that i would put that in there 
So that's a magnificent symbol. Okay, now we're running out of time here, but the final question that I've asked every artist I've interviewed, which is like far too many of them, like 50 mm -hmm. or 60 at this point. Wow. Uh, will you accept a challenge from me? Certainly. Okay. The challenge is, take a song of your choice from Acts of God and make a music video where it's just you guys smashing things in a rec room. Yeah? And what song would it be? That's a great idea. Uh, man, you know what? Uh, we already did the video for Apostle, but that would have been a good one to do for that. Hmm. Yeah. I could smash some shit to Apostle. All right. Uh, I wish you all the best with Acts of God. I know your fans are going to love it. Is there anything else you wish to say before we end this? Uh, no, I just, I really just look forward to getting out there and seeing everybody again. We have got friends all over uh, the United States and Canada that we haven't seen in a pack of years. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just looking forward to doing that and playing these songs for everybody. I hope you got the full length. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the rest of us will be getting it on February 18th. So we'll see you soon. All right. And we're out of time now, so I'd like to thank you, Steve, for joining me on the Hardcore Punk Project. Stay safe and be well. Thank you, man. You too. Be good, man. All right.